welcome back from uh, from the break. Um, so back to the the last um, two or three weeks of the semester. Um, so uh, as I mentioned to you just before the break, you know we have just very limited time left uh, in this class, and so I'm picking out just. Uh, a few priority things I want to tell you about uh, before I lose you um, after another seven classes or so. And so um, the the priority things that I'm I'm covering now are about uh, quantum mechanics with uh, multiple particles. That's in uh, chapter five point one, section five point one. Uh, and then uh, applying that to uh, atoms with more than one electron, that's in uh, 5.2. Uh, and then um, an, an introduction to perturbation theory, that is a, a way of doing approximations. Okay. So um, in the, the class just before the break, um, I started telling you a, a little bit about uh, quantum mechanics with uh, more than one particle. Okay. And um, the point there was that you have a, a wave function that depends on more than one position. Okay. And so uh, you can have uh, a wave function which depends on in principle, the position of the first particle and the spin of the first particle and the position of the second particle, the spin of the second particle, and so on for many particles and perhaps also on time. Um, and um, so there's, there's really a lot inside of that wave function. Um, and so, um, you know, in principle, we could imagine solving Schrodinger's equation to get that wave function and see how it evolves in time. And then we could figure out properties of that solution. You know, what is the probability of having particles at different positions at different times? Um, or calculating expectation values of things. Um, now, in general, that's a very difficult problem. And so there's a lot of advanced quantum mechanics research that has to do with how can you actually solve Schrodinger's equation in situations like that. Um, so there are just a few simplified cases that we can talk about here. Okay. And one simplified case is for um, non-interacting particles. That is to say that the potential energy, right, in principle, it could be a function of the position of particle one, particle two, particle three, and so forth, right? It could be any old function like that. Um, the, the simplified case for non-interacting particles is where it's the sum. It's a potential energy that depends on particle one plus a potential energy that depends on particle two plus something that depends on particle three and so forth. Okay. So, most potential energies are not like this, right? Most potential energies uh, depend on things like, um, well, let's say the difference. Uh, so as, as opposed, right here, opposed to um, uh, V of R1 minus R2. Right? That, that would be a more typical kind of case, that it depends on the distance between particle one and particle two. All right? um, that's a harder thing. Okay. So suppose that it just depends on the 
positions of particles one, two, three, separately. And it doesn't depend on the distance between the particles. Okay. Um, in that case, we can solve for the wave function um, using separation of variables. Okay. And um, that's something that we did last time. Okay. And so we found we could do the solution with uh, separation of variables. And then the wave function, which you know, in principle could be any function of R1, M1, R2, M2, et cetera, and time, that could be written as the product of separate single particle wave functions. So that is, it, this thing could be written as the product of some function of the coordinates for particle one and a function for the coordinates of particle two. Let's say this is a function A, psi A for particle one and psi B for particle two. And then a function of time, the e to the minus i energy t over h bar. Okay, so what this means, this kind of expression, is that um, the R1 and R2, this has to do with which particle we're looking at. So this is for particle one. This is for particle two. Okay. Um, and so each of the particles has a position and a spin, R1, M1, R2, M2, okay? And then the, the letter that's the subscript on the psi, that means state A or state B. So each of these states is some solution of the single particle problem. Okay, so we say psi A and psi B are two solutions for the single particle. Um, Schrodinger equation. So, for example, if we have the um, harmonic oscillator, okay, then we know that the solutions for the harmonic oscillator are. Um, certain, you know, Hermit polynomials times an exponential, right? And those solutions you know, are parameterized by a certain quantum number, okay? So we might say that psi A is the harmonic oscillator solution with n equals 13, okay? And psi b is the harmonic oscillator solution with n equals 14. So it's one of these functions that we already figured out, right? Or we could say, for a, a particle in a box. Maybe psi A of X is this uh, root 
two over little a, uh, sine 13 pi x over a psi b is sine 14 pi x over a, right? It's, these are two different functions of x, right? They're two different solutions that we already found, okay? And so these are two solutions for the single particle problem. And now, um, psi a depends on the coordinates for particle one. And psi b depends on the coordinates for particle two, okay? So this equation means that um, particle one is in state A and particle two is in state B. And since particle one is in state A, it has energy E sub A. And since particle two is in state B, it has energy E sub B. And then the total energy over here is E A plus EB. Okay, and you know, we worked out before the break that this is a solution of Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so this all works if the particles all are distinguishable. This is all okay if the particles are distinguishable. That is, you know which one is particle one and which is particle two, okay? So this is fine if they are different types of particles. For example, if one is a proton and one is an electron. That is great, okay? Now, there's an extra complication though, if the particles are not distinguishable. That is, if the particles are identical. Uh, indistinguishable, okay? And that is that if the particles are indistinguishable, if you have two electrons, for example, then there is this extra symmetry requirement. And for now, I'm just telling you that this requirement is there. Um, there are more advanced ways based on relativistic quantum mechanics uh, to prove that this requirement is there. Okay, but I'm just telling you that there's this extra requirement that the wave function needs a certain symmetry under exchange of the particles. Uh, it yeah, needs a symmetry under exchange, that is swapping the labels of the particles. Now, what the requirement is depends on the type of particle. 
And in particular, it depends on whether the particles are bosons or fermions. Okay, so let me uh, do a split screen here. And I will separately tell you the story for um, bosons and fermions. Okay, so bosons versus fermions. Okay, so bosons, that is to say, particles that follow Bose Einstein statistics. versus fermions are particles that follow uh, Fermi-Dirac statistics. Okay. And I am telling you that the distinction between these particles depends on the spin of the particles, that the particles with which follow Bose-Einstein statistics are particles with a spin that's an integer, zero, one, two, et cetera. And fermions are particles with spin that's a half integer. So one half, three halves, five halves, et cetera. Okay, so what is the requirement? Okay, for both Einstein statistics, the requirement is that the wave function must be symmetric under exchange. Okay. So um, that means that the wave function psi of R1 M1, R2, M2, and time has to be a big sign. Has to equal psi of R2, M2, R1, M1, and time. Okay. So here you can see I've swapped the positions for. R1 and M1 with R2 and M2, right? Here they've been swapped, okay? And the wave function has to be exactly the same. Okay? And by comparison with Fermi-Dirac statistics, the wave function must be anti-symmetric under exchange. Okay, so that means that psi of R1, M1, R2, M2, and time equals the negative of psi of R2, M2, R1, M1, and time. Okay. So again, you can see that the change I made over here is that I just swapped the positions of the um, R1, of the, M, of the coordinates for particle one and the coordinates for particle two. So both the R, R's and the M's, right? So the positions and the spins for um, all these particles, okay? Um, now, uh, this works if you have uh, two particles, right? What if there are even more than two, okay? Well, uh, if there are more than two particles, um, then we would say it has to be totally symmetric. Oops. Totally symmetric. That is, 
you can swap any two of the particle labels and you get the same wave function over here. Okay, so if you have um, psi of R1, M1, R2, M2, R3, M3 in time, right? If I decide to swap number two and number three, I keep one in the same place. R3, M3, R2, M2 in time, right? So that's, um, you know, I can do the swap for any two and uh, I still get exactly the same psi. That's what totally symmetric means. And the analogous thing for fermions is it has to be totally anti-symmetric. And that means that if I swap any two, then psi changes sign. So any two R two M two R three M three in time. Okay, then this equals the negative of psi of R one M one R three M three R two M two in time. Okay, so this is a. Uh, the, the requirement, okay, for bosons and for fermions. And you know, both kinds of these particles exist, right? So for example, photons are bosons and um, electrons are fermions. So you know, both of these things are out there. Um, so now you might say, well, how is it possible to make a wave function that has these symmetry or anti-symmetry properties? Okay, so suppose we have um, non-interacting particles. Okay, so suppose, you know, just as on the first slide, um, that the potential energy is uh, a sum of potential energies the way I wrote before. Okay, so um, before I said, well, maybe the, the wave function, the separable state R1, R2, M2 time, right? The separable state is like a psi A of R1, M1, psi B of R2, M2, e to the minus I, energy T over each bar. Um, that's, that's a nice state, okay? But it doesn't have the right symmetry or anti-symmetry. Okay, um, it, it, it has the, the wrong symmetry properties because you know, it doesn't satisfy the equation that I wrote before, right? So if I swap the labels, uh, so if I swap R1 and R2, and the same for M's, okay, then this is, psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1, the same time dependent thing. And we look at that and say, well, that's not right, right? Because that is neither the same thing as the first line, nor the negative of the first line, right? So, this has the, the wrong symmetry. So we need a way to fix it up. Okay. So it's 
this thing, it is a solution of Schrodinger's equation, but it has the wrong symmetry to describe um, um, indistinguishable particles, okay? So we, we need a way to fix it up, okay? So we can say, how, how to fix it? Okay. And um, again, I'll do, I'll do a split screen here. Okay. So for bosons, we can fix it by making uh, a linear combination of the separable states. That the states individually do not have the right symmetry, but we could make a combination of them, okay? So we could say, let's make a combination where psi, as a function of all this stuff, is some normalization constant. And then we'll write the first thing, psi A, R1, M1, psi B, R2, M2, plus psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1. And all of that times the same exponential factor with time. Um, okay, now, you know, I'm running out of room. It's, I won't do a split screen. Let me, let me write it all out and then I can do more calculations with it. I'll do the fermions in a minute. Okay, so if, here, I'm gonna write it out. So psi A, R1, M1, psi B, R2, M2, plus psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1, times this exponential thing. Okay, and now what happens if we swap the coordinates? Okay, so then if we, under this exchange, R1, R2, M2, R1, M1, and time. Let's see. Now it's psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1, plus psi A of R1, M1, psi B of R2, M2, times the same exponential thing. Okay, and now if we compare the first line and the second line, we can say, oh, well, the, the, the thing over here, that's exactly the same as what's written over there, okay? And this is the same as what's written there, okay? And um, then um, they are equal. Okay, so those things are, are equal. So this is the right symmetry for bosons. Okay, so you'll notice, right, when we have this linear combination of separable states, that now we can't tell is particle one in state A and particle two in state B, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe particle two is in state A and particle one is in state B, right? The, the wave function is agnostic about that, right? The wave function is neutral about which particle is in which of the states, but right? this wave function only says that one particle is in state A and one particle is in state B, but it doesn't care about which particle is in which of the states, 
Now, we can fix it up for fermions in um, a very similar way. Okay. And so to fix it up for fermions, we would say that the wave function R1, M1, R2, M2, and time, right? That that should be a normalization constant. And we'll say psi A of R1, M1, psi B of R2, M2, minus what you get if you exchange them. So psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1, times this exponential. Okay, and then what happens if you exchange the labels of one and two? So psi of R2, M2, R1, M1, and time. Okay, so now on the right side of the equation, I'll exchange those labels. So it's psi A of R2, M2, psi B of R1, M1, minus psi A of R1, M1, psi B of R2, M2, times the same exponential thing. And now we can see that um, the first term here is the negative of the second term here, right? And this term is the negative of this term, okay? So this is equal to the negative of psi of R1, M1, R2, M2, and time, okay? So this now has the correct anti-symmetry for fermions. Okay. Um, in all of these cases, the A here is a normalization constant as in everything we've been doing in the semester. Okay, so um, this is how you can make a state with the correct symmetry or anti-symmetry out of single particle states, okay? So um, a simple product doesn't work anymore, but this combination works for making symmetric or anti-symmetric states out of two particles, okay? Now, what if there's more than two? Well, it, it still works. The, the, there's a generalization of this kind of thing for more than two particles. The point is that you need to um, include all the possible permutations of the particle indices. So for three particles, there are three factorial permutations, right? That's six permutations, because the first thing could be one or two or three, and then the second thing could be well, the two th possibilities you haven't had so far. Right? Um, and so for bosons, you have to add up all the permutations, all with the same sign. For fermions, you add up all the permutations, but some of them have plus signs and some of them have minus signs. Um, and so it, it, it still works, right? That, that kind of a concept. Um, now, um, what you might be wondering at the moment is the question of, um, you know, wh why should you care about this, right? And so um, we, we could ask, um, well, let's pose it this way, say, is 
the symmetry or anti-symmetry important? Right? Maybe you might think, I don't really care whether my wave function is positive or negative. So why should I care about some symmetry rule that says whether the wave function keeps the same sign or change a sign? Okay. But the answer is yes, it is important. Okay. And let me show you a couple of reasons why it is important. Okay. So why you should care. So let's say uh, reason number one. Okay. Um, suppose we try to put um, two identical particles into the same state. And let's call that state A. Okay. So um, that means, you know, the same state A means some single particle wave function, psi A, as a function of R and M. Okay. Let's try it for bosons. Okay. So then we would say that the wave function as a function of R1, M1, R2, M2, and time, that is some coefficient A times psi A of R1, M1, then psi still, here's another A right? Because we're putting both particles in the same state. So state B equals state A. So psi A of R1 M1 times psi A of R2 M2 plus psi A of R2 M2 psi A of R1 M1 times the exponential thing in time. Okay, so here, you can see the first term is exactly the same thing as the second term, right? These are two copies of the same term. So this is uh, 2a psi a of r1 m1 psi a of r2 m2. That's this exponential thing. Okay. No problem. This is a nice, simple state for bosons, right? Where they both go into, uh, whether both identical bosons are in the same quantum mechanical state, A. Okay, now let's try it for fermions. Okay. So now we would say psi of R1, M1, R2, M2 in time, right? That's coefficient and psi A of R1, M1. Psi A of R2, M2 minus psi A of R2, M2 psi A of R1, M1 times this time thing. So now let's look at what's inside the brackets here. Look, the first thing cancels the second thing, right? Choo, choo, okay. This whole thing equals zero, okay. So, it, it equals zero. That is to say, there is no such state. This cannot be done. Okay. So the word for that 
is the um, Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, so we could say uh, that we cannot put um, two identical fermions uh, into the same state. Okay, so this is you know, a, a major consequence of the anti-symmetry for fermions, which is different from bosons, and it's different from um, distinguishable particles. Um, I'll, I'll emphasize it's the same state for position and spin. We can put two identical fermions into the same position state if they're in different spin states, or into the, you put them in the same spin state if they're in different position states, but you can't put them into the same state for both position and spin. Okay. So that has a special consequence for um, spin one half particles, which are you know, like electrons. Um, for spin half, right, you know that there are two spin states. Right, that the spin can be plus half or minus half, right, up or down. Okay, so in that situation, we can say um, in each position state, um, we can have two spin states. So this will have important consequences for atomic physics uh, that I'm going to talk about later this week. Um, okay, so um, that's one important consequence of the Pauli exclusion principle, or one co important consequence of the um, of the distinction between bosons and fermions. Okay, now let me show you a second consequence of that distinction. Okay, so a second reason why the distinction between bosons and fermions is important. Okay, so let's actually think through how to do a calculation of an expectation value. Okay, so. Um, I, I want to show you an example of that. Um, suppose, uh, suppose we want to calculate uh, the average distance between the particles. So, you know, how far apart are the particles? Well, that's an expectation value, okay? So suppose we want to know the, the expectation value of the distance between the particles. Or actually what I, what's easier to calculate is the expectation value of the distance squared, okay? So the distance squared is like this. The, difference of the vectors, R1 minus R2 uh, quantity squared, okay? And so we could work that out as the expectation value of R1 squared plus R2 squared. So this is a vector absolute value. R1 squared plus R2 squared minus two R1 dot R2 
two. Or we could write this out as um, separate averages. So it's the average of R1 squared plus the average of R2 squared minus two times the average of R1 dot R2. Okay, so this is a very specific thing to calculate, right? And so it will tell you something about, you know, you have particles floating around, how far apart are they? Okay, that seems like a, a important thing to know in a, in a two particle system. Um, The reason why I'm calculating the square and I'm not calculating this thing, the just the absolute value of the distance by itself, is just that the square is easier. Right? The square, calculating the square is, um, well, you'll see it's hard enough in a, in a few minutes. Um, and, um, but this uh, absolute value without the square, you know, it would be a harder thing, right? It would be it would be the square root of the inside the uh, expectation value of the first line, and so I'm not going to do that. Okay, so let's try to do this calculation, okay. and um, I'm going to do this calculation for three cases. Okay, for distinguishable particles, and then for bosons and for fermions. And I want to prove to you that the answer actually depends on which of these cases you're in, that these give three different answers. Okay. So um, let's try that, okay? So we'll say for case one, if we have um, distinguishable particles, Um, in, in the simplest kind of state, in the separable state. So that is that psi of R1, R2 and time is psi A of R1 times psi b of r2 times this exponential factor p of root. Okay, so let's see how to do that calculation. Okay, by the way, I'm going to, I'm getting tired of writing this exponential factor in time, uh, which isn't really doing anything here. So I'm going to shift to using the time independent wave function which drops that factor. So that's the lowercase psi. That's the psi A of R1 times lowercase psi B of R2. Okay, so this is you know, like what we've done for the one particle Schrodinger wave functions all semester, okay? And so I'm gonna do it now for the two particle wave function. Okay, so it's uh, yeah, psi a of r one side times psi b of r two. Got it. Okay, so now let's calculate the various terms that are here. Okay, so if we want to know what is the expectation value of r one squared in that state, okay, we can figure that out using the same method that we've been doing all semester with making the um, inner product, also known as this uh, integral sandwich. Okay, so that then is an integral over all possible positions for particle one and all possible positions for particle two of psi star r1 squared times psi. 
okay? This is our normal integral sandwich, like we've been doing all semester, except that we need to integrate over all of the coordinates for particle one and all the coordinates for particle two. Okay. So let's, let's do this, okay? So this is an integral over all the coordinates for one and all the coordinates for two of psi a of r1 star, psi b of r2 star, okay? times r1 squared times psi a of r1 psi b of r2. Okay, so this is just using this expression for psi, right? That depends on both r1 and r2. It's just the product, psi a of r1 times psi b of r2. So here's the product. Here is the product complex conjugate. Okay, now we can factor this integral into stuff that depends on R1 times stuff that depends on R2. So this is, let's multiply out stuff that depends on R1 times stuff that depends on R2. Okay. So this is psi A star of R1, psi B star of R2. And here is the R1 squared, and here is psi A of R1, and here is psi B of R2. Okay, you can see these two integrals have nothing to do with each other. Right? This is an integral over R1 that's unrelated to R2. Right? This is an integral over R2 that's unrelated to R1. Now, um, I mean, that's a nice special property for the separable states. It's not true in general, okay? But in this simple case, we can do it. We can separate it into two independent integrals, okay? And now we can do the integrals, okay? So the second integral here, the integral over R2, okay? This is just one, right? Because this is the normalization integral for psi b. So we'll say this is one, assuming that psi b is normalized. Um, okay. And what about the first integral, right? Well, we, I, I, I don't know how to do it, but I can give it a name. Okay. I'll it, I can interpret this integral as the average of r squared in state a. Okay, so if state A is like the, that's a squared. If state A is like, you know, state number 13 for a simple harmonic oscillator, okay, then for that state number 13, there's some value of R squared, okay, and whatever it is, this is it. Okay, so the, the first term in this sum, is some property of state A. All right. Now, um, I can do the same kind of calculation for the second term, okay? So the second term is this uh, R2 squared average, okay? And, and the whole calculation works with the same argument. Okay, so just to come down to the answer, that is the average of R2 squared. That is the average of R squared in state B. It is a property of state B. Okay. 
Okay. What about the dot product here? This thing, that looks more complicated. Um, let's figure that one out. Okay. So um, that's another integral sandwich. Okay. So um, if I want the average of the dot product of R1 dot R2, okay? So that's going to be an integral over R1 times an integral over R2 times what? Um, so we have psi A star of R1, psi B star of R2. Then R1 dot R2, then psi A of R1, psi B of R2. Um, the point is, once again, we can factorize this into stuff that depends on R1 times stuff that depends on R2. Okay, so here we have an integral over R1, an integral over R2, psi A star of R1, psi B star of R2. R1 dot R2, like that. And then psi A, of R1 and psi B of R2. And now we can label these integrals. This integral is the average of R1 in state A. This integral is the, the average of R, actually I shouldn't even say R1, it's just the average of R in state A. And this integral is the average of R in state B. So, um, you know, in any state, there's a certain average R. It might be zero, it might be not zero. Um, but in any state, we can calculate the average of R. And so here we have the dot product of two average R's, one in state A, one in state B. Okay, so putting all of these results together, we would say that the average of the distance squared is um, some property of state A, so the R squared in state A, plus the R squared in state B, minus two times a dot product of these two uh, expectation values. The average of R vector in state A, dotted with the average R vector in state B. Okay, so this is our result for distinguishable particles. Now, I want to do the same kind of calculation for um, bosons and fermions and show you that the answer comes out quantitatively different from this, okay? So that the symmetry uh, actually matters. Um, this is um, a little bit of a messy calculation, but I think you know it's it's worth it to show you an example of how to do these calculations, and then um, I will try to do a Mathematica demo related to this tomorrow. Um, okay, so um, here I'm going to start this. I may not actually be able to finish today, but I'll start it today and I can finish tomorrow. 
Uh, okay, so let's do now um, case two for bosons with the same spin M. And I will simultaneously do case three for fermions with the same spin M. So I will do this by writing out the wave function as um, psi plus or minus, okay? So here uh, we'll say, uh, let's put that in red. We'll say plus for bosons and minus for fermions. So psi plus or minus as a function of R1 and R2. I could write that as the product psi A of R1 times psi B of R2 plus or minus psi A of R2, psi B of R1. So um, you can recognize that this, when I have the top sign, the plus sign, that corresponds to the symmetric solution for bosons. And when I have the bottom sign, the negative sign, that corresponds to the anti-symmetric solution for fermions. And in either case, the normalization constant is one over root two. So this all works um, assuming that uh, A and B are different. Because if they were the same, then um, then it would be zero for fermions. It couldn't it couldn't happen at all. Um, and these states we're assuming are orthonormal, like our solutions for the particle in a box or our solutions for the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so now. Um, we still want to calculate this same uh, set of three terms, right? The average of R1 squared, the average of R2 squared, and the dot product term, okay? We want to calculate those three terms for this psi plus or minus state, that is for either the bosons or the fermions. Okay, let's do it. All right, it's a little bit messy, but let's see what I can do. Okay, so if we want to know what is the average of R1 squared, okay, so that is the integral of uh, over R1 and R2. And we have the state, psi plus or minus, complex conjugate, times R1 squared, times the state, psi plus or minus. Um, okay, so now we have to put in what is psi plus or minus. This is one over root two, psi a of R1 psi B of R2 plus or minus psi A of R2 psi B of R1. Okay, and the same thing over here, one over root two psi A of R1 star psi B 
of R2. It's a two. Star plus or minus psi B of R1, not star, oops, not star, psi A of R, no, yes, star. <laughs> I'm going crazy here. Psi A, uh, psi B of R1 star, psi A of R2 star, like that. Yes, everything on the left side of the integral sandwich, the bra is starred and everything on the right side is not starred. Okay, so that means there's two terms for the bra and there's two terms for the cat, right? On the left and right sides of the sandwich. So there are four terms in all. So we have to multiply out these things and work out all four terms, okay? So there's an overall factor of one half, okay? From the root two times the root two. Okay, now in the first term, we have an integral of R1 and an integral over R2. Okay. I'm going to put all the R1 stuff in the R1 integral and all the R2 stuff in the R2 integral. Okay, so now, um, I've got to multiply out four things. Okay, so let's do the first times the first. Okay, so that is a psi a star of r1 times r1 squared. Uh, let's see, and the psi, excuse me, psi b star of r2. Psi a star of r1, psi b star of r2, then R1 squared, and then psi A of R1, psi B of R2. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay, now let's do the second one. Again, I'm going to have an integral over R1 and an integral over R2. Okay, let's do. The first thing, the first term over here times the second term over there. This is, oops, psi a star of r1, psi b star of r2. Then we have an r1 squared, and now, I'm doing the second term over here. So there is a psi a of r2 and a psi b of r1. Okay, and you'll notice I'm putting the r1 stuff in the first integral and the r2 stuff in the second integral. Now what? Now, let's multiply out the, um, the second term on the left times the first term on the right. Oops. So an integral over R1 and R2. Right. So the second term on the right gives on the left, gives us psi b star of r1 times psi a star of r2. Then r1 squared, then uh, let's see, I want the first term on the right. So psi a of r1 times psi b of r2. And one more term to figure out. And that is if I multiply the second term on the left times the second term on the right. 
And so that is, uh, whoops, psi b star of r1, psi a star of r2, then r1 squared, and then psi a of r2, psi b of r1. Right, okay. Now, the one thing that I forgot to do is take care of the plus or minus signs. Okay, so let's go back and fix up those things. All right, so in the first line, I have the first term times the first. There's no plus or minus signs. So this is a plus, great. Okay. In the second line, I have the first term times the second, okay. There's a plus or minus on that. So this second line should have a plus or minus sign. Then if I have the second term on the left times the first term on the right, again, there's a plus or minus sign right there. So this should have a plus or minus sign. Okay, now what? Now, if we have the second term on the left times the second term on the right, okay, there are two factors of plus or minus signs, there and there, okay? So for the top case, it's plus times plus, that's plus. In the bottom case, it's minus times minus, that's also plus, okay? So actually the plus just there by itself, that's good. Okay, now let's see if we can simplify these things. All right, so first we will look at, let's look at the R2 integrals. Those are easier to think about. So for the first R2 integral right up here, okay, that's the integral over R2 of psi b star times psi b. That's one because it's normalized. What about in the bottom? That's the integral over R2 of psi a star times psi a. That's one. Again, because psi a is normalized. What about in this line where we have the integral over R2 of psi b star times psi a. That is zero because we are assuming these states are orthonormal, right? So psi b is orthogonal to psi a. And the same in this line that psi a and psi b are orthogonal to each other. So this integral is zero. Okay, now let's look in the, um, the, the R1 integral, okay? So for this first R1 integral, the interpretation of this is the average of R squared in state A. All right, this is an integral over R1 of R1 squared in state A. Likewise, in the bottom line, we have the integral of uh, over R1 of R1 squared times this probability density in state B. So this makes the average of R squared in state B. Right. Now, th these terms are a little bit more complicated, but luckily I don't have to think about them because they're multiplied by zero. Okay, so who cares what they are? All right, 
So this tells us then that the um, for bosons or fermions, okay, the average of R1 squared is equal to a half of, that's from this overall uh, half, a half of this and this, okay? So it's a half of the average of R1, of, excuse me, not R1, of R squared in state A plus R squared in state B, okay? So you'll notice, right, here we don't know whether particle one is in state A or state B, right? For the distinguishable particles, we knew that this average had to do with state A because particle one was in state A. But now we don't know whether particle one is in state A or state B, and that is consistent with this uh, calculation, right? That the average of R1 squared is the average of something for state A and something for state B, okay? And I will tell you that if you repeat the same calculation for particle two, that the average of R2 squared is the same thing. It is the average of R squared in state A plus the average of R squared in state B. And you can work out those four terms for practice. Okay. How am I doing on time? I am out of time. Yikes. Okay, I will have to stop here and I will complete this big calculation with the dot product term um, tomorrow. And um, so then we can try to interpret it all tomorrow. All right, I'll take a break here and pick up at exactly this point tomorrow. All right, thanks. I'll see you guys then.